Community Action Reinforcing Empowerment. CARE, a model of community-based education, practice, and university citizen participatory research, Integration of Education, Research, and Praxis by George Jacinto. We will begin with the following preface. CARE is a framework from which to build community transformation. There are a series of steps that may or may not fit with your situation. It is best to complete a community needs and asset assessment to develop a plan of action. Each area of the country has many variants that point to a range of issues and potential responses. Figuring out the gaps in services is an important piece of information that can be accomplished by directly engaging the recipients who lack necessary resources. In this workshop, we will explain the CARE framework as it is applied to one community. At the end of the workshop, we will examine how to extrapolate from the CARE framework to address the needs of your locale. Now, in terms of personal growth reflection, I think that's important as we do any kind of workshops to kind of reflect on our own journey along this way. So as we move through the workshop, think about your own therapeutic use of self and praxis. How have you come about developing that and what does that look like to you today in your mind? And then over time we develop a sense of a self over the processes we experience in terms of experience and training, which we might construe as what today is called deliberate practice. Deliberate practice is the process in which we intentionally build competencies and skills that we apply to our work. Now we will focus on the goals and objectives of the workshop. Upon completion of this workshop, participants will have the ability to apply the CARE model to a community setting. The objectives. At the end of the workshop, you will be able to develop a strategy to invite public officials, community agencies, other university departments, and citizens to frame an approach that will be appropriate for your local situation. Second, you'll be able to describe a university-wide or agency-wide strategy for engagement of citizens to participate in planning, development, and research to transform the environment. And three, you will be able to apply the CARE model in a community setting. The contents of this workshop are as follows. This introductory section, which will be followed after this slide by a brief contextualization of this workshop within the conference, after which a brief overview video of the CARE model will be presented, followed by a university community collaboration, more in-depth discussion about implementation of the CARE model in a particular context and then more generically weaving methods and frameworks about community development the care model being one of the frames but other suggestions and ideas as well i encourage all of you to be creative in your many efforts and then finally ending with a closing summary that overviews what we have talked about during this hour workshop now i would like to offer a brief introduction to the workshop i'd like to begin by contextualizing this workshop within the thematic focus of the International Conference. The CARE model is a process map for social and economic transformation. As I contemplated my own practice over time, I realized that there were different lenses with which to conceptualize practice. Working in the Mid-South, it became clear that social services were important elements of co-building transformation. However, holistically, it made sense to pay attention to the environment surrounding the clients and their problems in terms of social service provisions. Working with health and mental health issues required concern about the well-being of clients. Maslow's hierarchy of needs was one lens from which to view client situations. Over the years in policy practice courses, I had students reflect on the hierarchy of need that impacted overall health of individuals, certainly physiological and security needs or the foundation upon which psychological needs are built. The basic needs must consider economic safety and well-being as an example. We will also examine two areas that are important to see a fuller picture of what are, we are developing, and this requires association with others with whom we are working. First, we will look at what I consider the big R reality and the small R reality and reflect on how 
Many perceptions of the big R help us develop a more complete picture of what is happening. Therefore, involving a range of people with differing views is most rich in terms of this process of co-building. Second, reflecting on our preferences about how to solve the problem. Do we prefer to solve problems by looking at the whole, in other words, perceiving from the whole to the parts, conceptualizing the whole picture and examining the parts, versus examining the parts where we work from the trees in the forest to try to address issues in that manner. Making a conscious effort to use both ways of viewing the elements of the issue would be helpful in providing a more holistic and effective development of resources. By examining a range of views, we end up taking ideas from both extremes and come into the meadow in the middle where tremendous insights and opportunities merge that are often more effective ways to address various problems. Additionally, determining our problem-solving preferences and inviting others that view the world differently to co-build for social and economic transformation will lead to positive outcomes. These understandings lead to more comprehensive and synergistic ways of construing and addressing issues. You may approach this workshop from a deliberate practice lens that reflects your own practice. Think about co-building social and economic transformation in which you have or are currently engaged. Your previous co-building efforts were points of departure for the lens that is the focus of this conference. The global agenda may involve large-scale efforts, regional and local efforts. In practice, co-building is a daily experience with other professionals, community gatekeepers, and stakeholders with and on behalf of the clients with whom we serve. I suggest that you have a blank page with you as you experience this workshop and jot down deliberate practice, knowledge, and skills ideas that you want to add to your repertoire or of your professional toolbox. This video will briefly overview this concept of community action reinforcing empowerment, where one considers social support among the members of the community and agencies and faith-based organizations, social capital where people actually help each other by doing some sort of exchange of beneficial and reciprocal perhaps but the focus is on people, strengths, assets, resilience and hope. Organizing is an important activity during this era. One framework that I've developed was named Community Action Reinforcing Empowerment or the CARE Framework, a title suggested by students at a Mid-South Social Work Program. The first CARE Center was developed in Arkansas in 2010 in association with one of the state universities. The framework is flexible and can be adjusted to comply with various communities and their needs. As we review this framework, we will understand the importance of social support and social capital in the organizing process. The overarching concerns are with people, individuals, and community strengths, community assets, resilience, and hope for a positive future. The CARE mission is to develop a student unit to assist in addressing the social and economic needs of residents in a targeted community. This approach may also be used by community organizations that are attempting to enhance and assist communities in need. An overview of the process, beginning first to develop a base in the community. When selecting a community in which to work, discussion with residents assists in suggesting a location that would be best for locating services, and a discussion with city officials can be most beneficial, for instance, talking with the mayor, the chief of police, Faith-based organizations, businesses, and fraternal organizations would be some examples. Next, one would look to engage residents, meeting with residents, conducting focus groups, interviewing key informants in the community, and conducting a community needs assessment is most important, as well as an asset assessment. So there's a needs assessment and an asset assessment, looking both at the strengths and the needs of the community. Next, organizing residents. Here one would convene a community action team based on interviews and community meetings that would be the source of assisting and making choices about priority needs within the community. Next would be to plan interventions with which to offer the community, then priority ranking the interventions and the needs, thereby completion of the assessment of strengths and needs and then moving towards the actual plan. So we're looking at planning interventions and prioritizing them and then moving to implement 
the plan at some point within the community based on priority listing. So what's most important first, and then working down a list over time. Then evaluating the outcomes with documents that have been put together to assess the success of the program. And then reassessing the outcomes to determine further input from the community. And then again, back uh, kind of a circular process of engaging the residents for reflection and more suggestions in terms of the next approach within the community to address needs. In a little more detail, I'll talk about each of those uh, areas. In terms of developing a community um, base, one would look at partners such as city residents, key informants, city officials, as we talked about faith-based organizations, nonprofit organizations, the business community, social service providers, and if you have a university in the area, inviting the professors, instructors, and students to become part of the process. Next, organizing residents. CARE is committed to community development. Therefore, we will seek citizens' input to address the social and economic needs of the community. In addition, the CARE partner with residents, CARE partners with residents and existing providers to develop additional resources to improve the quality of life for those living in the area. Next, there is the assessment of strengths and needs a very critical piece of the work that you would be doing. CARE is committed to community development, therefore we will seek the input to address social and economic needs within the community. In addition, the center will partner with residents and existing providers to develop additional resources to implement the quality of life for those living in the area. So, in, in other words, to improve the quality of life that uh, those living there will experience. One of the tools that has been used in schools of social work is the windshield survey. Students drive through a community observing the features of the community, such as schools, parks, businesses, faith-based organizations, banks, community gardens, convenience stores, fast food restaurants, taking note on what is there and what is not there. In many communities, there are no grocery stores, and people must go great distances to purchase groceries. Also, there may not be any gas stations or reliable transportation. Next, interviewing the residents. In this case, one would meet with the residents either in their homes or invite them to a office or a location where the uh, agency is located in the community uh, and invite residents to participate in the community action team after responding to the questions that you would be asking them and to then make sure that you document responses from the residents so you can kind of sum together what the major pieces of feedback are from the community. Strengths and needs. One would assess the results of the visits with community members and then the community action team will priority list strengths and needs shared by the residents of the community. Priority rank community needs. The CAP members are valuable in that they carefully deliberate and rank the most pressing needs first. They will recommend transformation of the community addressing the needs into the provision of some kinds of resources to assist, to assist citizens to solve problems. This may include different kinds of services and economic resources that will become a reality to meet the citizens' needs. Next would be the planning of interventions, develop specific programs, provide needed resources, and organize the structure so that there's a protocol on which people can follow to know where they have to go when and to whom. Then implementing the plan, this is one of the more critical pieces of this process, launching the structures to deliver programming, which would involve finding secure physical location for the delivery of services and protection perhaps of confidentiality, hiring the personnel to provide services, and evaluating the effectiveness of the services provided in terms of implementation, functioning, and things that may additionally need to be added to make the services more robust. Then reassessing the strengths and needs of the community in light of the interventions that have been provided and looking toward what additional things need to be added to the next iteration in terms of work the community. And then finally re-engaging the members or residents of the community again. The process here has come full circle where you realize that you've assessed the strengths and needs and now you're with the CAT team re-engaging the community for further discussion about additional needs that may need to be addressed. This process takes time in getting to know the community and allowing community members to get to know those who are working with the empowerment process. University Community Collaboration, the locus of community-based participatory research. The first objective of this workshop is 
for individuals to develop a strategy to invite public officials, community agencies, university departments, and citizens to frame an approach that will be appropriate for the local situation. So one of the first things we did when looking at how to approach this was to try to configure a university community connection. And so the EcoMap are the circles above. Now each location has its own unique kinds of agencies and issues and health disparities, etc. So this is just one example. And then uh, what we have here is the uh, university care center uh, or is located between the two, the community and the university. Looking at interdepartmental collaboration at the university level, I was able to discuss this with a number of departments who were quite interested in participating as things went along and were developed in this process. The nursing and physical therapy departments were in the college I was located in in social work, and others were sociology, criminology, agriculture. They were talking about community gardens at the time in some of the churches, and I thought the agriculture department might be assistive in that, and they liked the idea. The business department, rehabilitation counseling, education, humanities, communications, and computer sciences. After I'd done a significant amount of work over a couple of months doing various interviews around the campus, I was told by the dean of the college where I was located that we could not include people from other colleges in the collaboration. So that kind of put a stop to some of the more creative things I was hoping to accomplish in this project. So then the next step would be to to connect with and invite community partners into the process. I initially started with the mayor and the chief of police in the city, and then it looked towards others who might be of interest in terms of social services, like hospice and there were other groups I talked with. And then fortunately, at an event I attended, the person who was in charge of HUD housing also was interested because she had significant HUD housing units in the community we were looking at. And then to generate a key list of um, informants in the target area. So uh, talking to different people, contacting some of the faith-based communities within the neighborhoods. There were, there's like almost a church in every corner in that area of the city. Talking with the ministers and seeking input about who would be people that would be leaders within the community. Also attending community faith-based meetings that were held in the area and public hearings as well. At the time there were some public hearings that the county and state were holding about issues of health disparities within the area. Having overviewed Objective 1 that focused on community partners, we will now turn to Objective 2, describe a university or community-wide strategy for engagement of citizens to participate in planning, development, and research to transform their environment. The CARE Office grand opening happened in the fall, the first semester we began to use this CARE model. Here you'll find a map of the city where the Social Work Department office on the campus was located here, and approximately five blocks north of there was the ASU CARE office, which was a part of a duplex in a HUD housing arrangement. So in the fall uh, Halloween weekend, we decided to launch the office offering food and drink, children's games, we even had a fire truck join us for the day, and community information tables from various agencies that might be of help to residents. Also, invitations for residents to share their ideas about change they would like to see in the community through interviews that would be held at the care office. The office had uh, two bedrooms, which uh, were our offices at the time we were using the facility. At the office, which was part of the two-bedroom apartment, was a prior police substation. Three students managed the interviews that took place. One greeted residents and oriented them to the interview process, and at the end of the interviews invited them to sign up for the community action team, or CAT team as we call it. Then in the offices, one student asked questions and one recorded in writing the answers that were given by the residents. And at the end of the interview, each resident was asked if they would like to join the community action team for ongoing involvement in planning and implementation of care and assessing its various program strengths during the first year. 
List of needs based on problem list. This list was generated after the interviews were completed. There were approximately 20 people that interviewed with the team. So the problem list that emerged was there was a high number of low-income residents living in that area. Health and mental health disparities were of prominent concern among residents, also underemployment or unemployment, and elderly residents particularly and some students were concerned about crime, both crime against persons and a lot of drug trade that went on in the neighborhood. Then there's also substandard housing for many residents. There's lack of businesses in the area, no banks, no employers had locations in that area, and there was essentially a food desert as well. There were no grocery stores near the community and complaints about insufficient transportation choices and a poor schedule in the transportation system. Community-based participatory research. I've referenced this in the next slide in terms of where it came from. Minkler, Garcia, Rubin, and Wellerstein had a wonderful booklet about CBPR. And so I took two key forms from them that I think inform what we were doing in the apartment city. First, under the best practices or promising practices, it suggests build an effective uh, partnership. And we identified and engaged key informants and developed a community action team of interested citizens. Then it suggests use asset identification. A needs assessment and asset assessment were part of the interviews that took place, as well as informal discussions with community residents over time, particularly those who came into the office. Third, reflect local ways and values. This is important because of the various traditions and mores that various communities hold, and this had a lot of churches residing in the community itself, which were great help to residents. So we incorporated both their spiritual religious concerns and their civic concerns, what they would like in terms of a better environment within which to live. Fourth, use multiple methods of data gathering. And we, uh, during the time the uh, start of this project uh, ensued, the data gathering included the 20 interviews, windshield surveys by students, discussions with key informants, assessment evaluation of outcomes. Also, the students' windshield surveys were one element of an exercise or assignment that I had given a practice three class. Basically what happened is once the students did their presentations, I had a panel of residents come in from the community to offer their perspectives on the community and a very interesting discussion ensued that was rich for both the students and the residents being able to engage and share. Five, demystifying the policy making process. This was done through education and training of students and community residents in policy analysis and planning. Six, engage children and youth. The Halloween grand opening was the launching pad for engagement with children and youth in the community. There was also a computer lab that was open after school for youth uh, that our students helped monitor after we moved into the office there, and exploring the development of early childhood morning care before school hours and after school programming. Uh, there was a concern because many of the mothers had to go to work early and there was no one to take care of the children during that period. And then rely on visual and social media was number seven. We placed a regional social and economic service online directory under the auspices of one of the faith-based communities in the area. And the online registry allowed people in the whole region, not just the city, to access services that they might have needed. And then, of course, the regional scale was the element that a lot of the agencies that offered assistance were more broadly focused in terms of their outreach. And so that not only helped this immediate community, but it provided a resource for others in the general area. Principles for Community-Based Participatory Research. There are 11 principles here, and I'd like to demonstrate how they, again, interact with the care process. Number one is to recognize the community as a unit of identity. This also is an element of developing the base and engaging the residents of the community. Two, builds on strengths and resources within the community. This definitely would come about after the assessment of needs and assets into the planning phase. Three, facilitate a collaborative 
equitable partnership in all phases of research involving an empowering and power-sharing process that attends to social inequalities. Again, the engagement of residents, the community action team, their involvement in assessing and evaluating current situation and recommending change within the community structure. Four, fostering co-learning and capacity building among all partners. This involves both the students in the community and the faculties, the residents of the neighborhoods involved in the change process. Five, integrates and achieves a balance between knowledge generation and intervention for mutual benefit of all partners. Again, this would be involved in the planning phase of the process with the residents' input as well as students, faculty, and community partners. Six, focuses on local relevance of public health problems and on ecological perspectives that attend to multiple determinants of health. And again, this was a community in which there were a lot of health disparities and proximity to medical facilities were considered a problem at the time, particularly because public transportation wasn't as efficient as it could have potentially been. So the care staff and the community action team began to look at how they might meet with city and county officials to determine both the public health issue and the issues of transportation. Seven involves systems development using a cyclical and iterative process. And that's basically what the care model is like. There's the development of the plan and implementation, and then the evaluation of outcomes, reassessment, and returning to engagement of residents to further develop the process that is being developed and implemented to bring about the change. It disseminates results of all partners and involves them in the wider dissemination of results. Again, the sustainability element of this cyclical process really helps reevaluate looking at the problem from various lenses, again, which we talked about earlier in our discussion this hour. This iterative process and the sustainability element of this is very important in terms of the co-builders of the implementation. Involves a long-term process and commitment to sustainability. Again, that's what we were talking about. The circular process of building and planning, implementing plans, evaluating, reassessing and engaging residents. This could go on for a number of years, annually reevaluating and then adjusting and adding perhaps more services based on discovery of need that may have been missed. Particularly this economic element, there's, there's both the social and the economic element that need to really be looked at and implemented over time. Then openly addressing issues of race, ethnicity, racism, social class, and embodies uh, cultural competency. I'm not so fond of humility. I don't know what that means. I know it's a current and popular term. And then 11 works to ensure research rigor and validity, but also seeks to broaden the bandwidth of validity with respect to research relevance. And that's part of this participatory research where the residents are as involved in the research dimensions as are the faculty and the students engaging with them. So this is kind of a summary of community-based participatory research as it meshes with the care process in this particular effort. Next, we will look at the idea of infusing learning and skills building within the courses at the university. The Social Work Practice 3 class assignment was to conduct a community assessment of the apartment city. In class, we had discussed the format for completing the assignment. In order to demonstrate the process, I placed four desks in the middle of the room and as if students were seated in a car. Each student had an assignment. In the front seat, there was the driver and the navigator who held the map in terms of orienting where to go for the review of what was going on within the sector of the city. In the back seat was an observer who talked about things that the person was seeing taking place. Students noticed some drug deals, for instance, uh, as part of their drive-through process, although they did get out in a couple of locations to talk with people and faith-based groups. They uh, interfaced with church members, and uh, that's how the discovery of community gardens 
emerged in terms of the discussion that ensued later. The person on the passenger side of the back seat was the photographer as they took pictures in order to put together their presentation for the class. So the sectors of the city, they looked at the neighborhoods, what if any businesses were proximate or within the neighborhoods. They stopped at several of the churches and talked with staff, looked at the parks that were present and the condition of the parks, schools and other features they wanted to share in their assessment of what they observed. So the students presented in class their observations and then I followed that up by inviting a panel of residents from the community to come to class and share their assessments and understandings of the community in which they live. This led to an interesting discussion and exchange between students and residents. The students realized that things are not as they seem to observers. For instance, one elderly lady had her apartment broken into three times. Students could not understand why anyone would stay in such a neighborhood. Further discussion revealed that this was her home for many years and there was no other place she would consider living. Constructing overlapping assignments that involve praxis and reflection can be further enhanced with additional input from perspectives of residents, as was done in this case. Additionally, students participated in a service learning assignments where they trained as members of the interview team that later interviewed 20 residents of the community. And then there are planned and changed events as part of the unfolding process. For instance, at one point I thought a walkthrough of the neighborhood by students would be helpful where they would walk through, knock on doors, and talk with residents. However, students were concerned about their safety within the community, plus they were going to do this project in the middle of January when oftentimes there may be snow on the ground and it could be quite cold. Both facts contraindicated the walkthrough and it was canceled as part of the process. It was later determined that we would interview residents in the care office and invite community members to participate. One of the projects that we engaged with with the uh, computer sciences department was to ask students to develop an online directory social work students who would collect the information and so one of the projects in a computer science course was to have students develop online sites and so two students took on the assignment and worked with the social work students who provided the information about the directory and this was essentially a social and economic services resource directory for northeast arkansas which was well received and magnolia road baptist church sponsored this site on their website as part of one of the building members of the board that was working with the development of the project and so the application of care, there was a direct application of the care framework that we've been looking at. However, we extrapolated parts of the care framework to other projects that I will share with you later. And also this idea of weaving of care with other models of community transformation is certainly an important element because care is a process model, but if you're dealing with like individual therapy, etc., that is more of a practice treatment model. So these models can be interfacing with each other and care is not the only framework around and so all of you are previously involved with things and have your favorite kinds of approaches to things either from the process point of view or from the practice point of view and so that's an important element to consider when looking at how you might co-build for social and economic transformation. This discussion will focus on examples of co-building social transformation while applying the CARE model to a particular project. First, we will fuse CARE with a practice model of suicide prevention. Please note I am only fusing one framework with CARE in this example. It is certainly possible to take relevant components of several models in order to co-build a particular social transformation project. While exploring these examples, reflect on how you might approach your work open to synthesizing and fusing models or parts of models and frameworks to fit your situation. We will now segue for a moment to reflect on 
perceptions of reality, which I think is appropriate in part of our discussion. As we see, the big R contains the global ideas about a particular subject, and the small r is our personal lens on what the big R offers us to address a particular problem. Each of us has a perspective, and the richness of sharing supports the concept that the sum of the parts intending a solution to a problem is greater than the individual perspectives. This is indeed a central element of co-building. The example that follows is about clinical social work practice. However, it can be extrapolated to our current conversation regarding co-building transformation that takes into account many pieces. Along with this idea, I want you to consider what I call the big R and little r reality. It's kind of a metaphor, but I think it makes sense in terms of what we're looking at and how you would bring about certain, you'd extrapolate certain theories into your practice. When talking about the big R with regard to evidence-based clinical social work theory, I'm discussing the global level. That is the place where all theories and possibilities are contained. This I call the big R. In other words, this would be the global container of all possible theories that one might use with clients. And as you see, the hands indicate what we're going to next, what, that I call the small r reality where individuals who have particular perspectives take from the global ideas into their own practice. The small r, and that is the level at which each of us develops our own ideas and therapeutic style as we extrapolate from the big r what works for us in our practice. So here would be an example of yourself having extrapolated from the big r. Having considered the big r and small r we will now reflect on the parts and the whole perspectives. Most of us have preferences as to the way we view problem solving. Some of us prefer to look at the parts of the puzzle, while others prefer to view from the lens of the global perspective or whole picture. It is helpful using the container of the big R to visualize both the parts and the whole. In many situations, services develop over time from the parts approach to the problem. A problem is seen and a specific solution is developed. However, most problems are multifaceted and there is a bigger picture impacting individuals, groups, communities, and organizations. We will first focus on the parts to the whole perspective. Over time, several mental health agencies were developed that are in these two counties. Some are multiple locations of one agency. In this image, there are many probable overlapping services in some agencies or among some agencies and a lack of services in some areas of the counties. As you see, there are large areas of land where nothing is available. So when perceiving responses to a problem, individuals develop strategies that address the problems that are pieces to a much larger puzzle. It is like me hugging the redwood tree. When we are in the forest, we see the trees. However, to get a handle on the whole picture, it is helpful to shift perspective. The whole to the parts or global perspective is where we perceive what is available in the environment to address an issue. What already exists most likely does not include all the possibilities that may be needed to address the issue. Envisioning the bigger picture or the whole, it is helpful to see what gaps exist in services. For instance, there are large areas without services according to the maps. In most areas, there are diverse communities with different needs and various levels of services. Clearly, there are places where access to services are non-existent, as we see in this map here. One challenge is to discover where underserved communities are located and to elicit input from citizens about their suggestions regarding needs that require services to address problems. These two lenses upon which to view issues help us bring together a more whole picture when we look at the parts to the whole and the whole to the parts and then seek input from those members of the community that live in both areas that we are working with. Now keeping in mind our different perspectives we will next move to examining elements from the big R as we co-build towards transformation. It is important to remember that as many voices as possible be shared related to those affected by whatever the transformation is upon which we are working. The following example of weaving frameworks together comes from the care model fused with a comprehensive treatment model. 
As you explore this co-building example with me, think about how you might co-build a social transformation plan. Remember, in your search for co-builders and models, you want to develop the most efficient and elegant approach to the issue which you are attempting to address. Co-building social transformation, fusion of frameworks. This is an example of how to fuse frameworks that bring into focus the pathway from visioning to implementation, evaluation, and revising the project. Co-building social and economic transformation requires careful reflection on the elements and necessary components of social transformation. In this case, we are looking at two maps. You may have a situation where you need several roadmaps that fuse together will assure an adequate transformation. In holistic practice, it becomes clear that social and economic transformation are two parts of an effective solution to community problems. I purposely left one off in this example to point out how it is important to always search for gaps in services. This can be accomplished by viewing the situation from two lenses, either from the parts to the whole at one point or whole to the parts. Both lenses help bring about gaps that we may be missing, and always keeping in mind the big R and small R components of social and economic transformation. This is the care framework that we have been discussing. It is important to realize that a macro approach depicts the steps of a process towards transformation and sustainability. Note that the process is circular. We kind of go around and then we come back uh, in terms of the approach. When evaluation and reassessment take place, then re-engagement of the stakeholders begins the new cycle, further revising and adding new services. Whether you use CARE as a template or not, it is important to find a sustainable process within which to travel through the transformation each time. The suicide prevention model is a micro approach that focuses on assisting individuals who are at risk for self-harm leading to suicide. The care model is a process model and this is a treatment or individually focused model that will be in a moment we'll show how to fuse that. But basically the components of this model have to do with this identifying and assisting individuals, increasing help seeking behavior, effective care and treatment, care transitions and linkages. This is very important because follow-up is critical. You can treat at one point, but if not following up to ensure reinforcement of what one has learned, it sometimes fails and you have people repeating the cycle. Again, responding to individual crises, postvention work, reduce access to means. That is the important piece that people not have means to the sources of self-harm. Life skills and resilience, of course, are follow-up uh, elements of this, which also may involve some kind of economic twist. And then the sense of connectedness, social support. So these would be elements of the micro uh, process that would be involved in this transformation effort. Co-building by weaving key services with the care framework. In this image, we examine co-building by weaving the key services. Here we see what we might call the fusion of process and practice. We'll note that based on the micro elements here fused in with the macro elements, for instance identify and assist the individual, this would develop from process set and forth looking at assets and strengths within the community and also the planning and intervention. Increasing self-seeking behaviors would also become part of this implementation of the process as well as the care and transformation linkages. Responding to the crisis would also involve the planning and intervention element. Uh, Postvention, of course, is the evaluation and reassessment kind of thinking that would go on in this process. Then reducing access to means to harm certainly part of the implementation, but also evaluating the success of that and how that might change as an example. Then, of course, life skills and resilience come both in the implementation plan that leads to inpatient, outpatient, and follow-up le levels of services. And then this connectedness element would have to do with, again, the implementation, but also re-engaging 
residents may involve those who have themselves been uh, recipients of the services offered by the particular project. So this looks very complex, but one needs to weave together in this case two, a micro and a macro process, the process and the services, and then moving then to the, the assessment phase or during this process. Again, this has focused on social transformation. However, a serious gap here is in the economic element that requires attention. You may have success with treatment where meaning and purpose becomes more clear to those who have worked with the program, but then the economic transformation is something that must take place in order to ensure the ability for people to live in a comfortable manner and not recidivate in terms of having further crises in terms of um, self-harm related issues. So during the process of developing the project initially or in, in this current iteration of the transformation on the reassessment phase or in the reassessment phase where the cycle begins again, transformation is not a one-time event by the way. It suggests an ongoing effort that is why the process model such as CARE is necessary to set steps forth where they sustain an ongoing involvement of programming. During or when health and mental health concerns are addressed initially, the economic component needs to be examined. In this image, we are reminded also that co-building sometimes includes a range of companions. As this CE comes to a close, I want to share with you my internet site, ggesento.org. When you get to the website, the menu lists a number of things, but I suggest use of self and practice, mutual aid, group resources, conference workshops and resources and forgiveness resources are helpful free tools that you might want to utilize. I've provided worksheets, some videos, some of my articles, and I hope that this is a resource that can be a benefit to you. So as we uh, go forth, I wish all of you the greatest success in your endeavors.